الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على سيد الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين وبارك وسلم تسليما كثيرا مزيدا إلى يوم يبعثون وبعد Respected brothers, respected youngsters, sisters, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Today's program is mainly about Masjid al Aqsa, the very masjid, and Al Quds, the very land that we have forgotten today. And it's very good to see some youngsters here showing an interest in this. But I presume none of you are. Uh, Chelsea or Manu or Arsenal or Liverpool fans are you? Because they all played yesterday. No? So alhamdulillah you're released for today. Indeed. So today's program uh, is mainly about why Masjid Al-Aqsa is important to us, the Muslims. Uh, number two, how the land of Al-Quds was handed over to the Muslims. First question is why is Masjid al-Aqsa so important to the Muslims, okay? And this is going to be a bit of interaction as well from the brothers and sisters as well, okay? Firstly, does anyone know which was the first masjid built on this planet? This is for the youngsters, if any of the sisters know the answer as well. Jin. Kaaba, yes. And that's mentioned in the Quran. Inna awwala bayti wudiya linnasi lalladhi bi bakkata mubaraka. Bakka is Mecca in the Quran, it's known as Bakka, it's also Mecca as well. So that was the first masjid built on this planet. And then the second masjid built on this planet was anyone? Masjid Al-Aqsa, yes. And the gap was 40 years. Okay. Abu Dhar al-Ghifari, he asked the Prophet, which was the first masjid built? Prophet said it was the Kaaba. Second, he said Masjid Al-Aqsa. Okay. And he said, what was the gap? He said, 40 years. Right. Who built the Kaaba? Or the original Kaaba, I should say. Ji. First it was Adam Ali. Well then, yes. It was Adam Ali Sadusa. Okay. Who rebuilt the foundations of the Kaaba as we see it today? Ji. Yes. وَإِذْ يَرْفَعُ إِبْرَاهِيمُ الْقَوَاعِدَ مِنَ الْبَيْتِ وَإِسْمَعِيلُ رَبَّنَا تَقَبَّلْ مِنَّا إِنَّكَ أَنْتَ السَّمِيلُ عَدِيمُ Ibrahim والسلام, with his son Ismail والسلام, they built, rebuilt the Kaaba. Okay, Allah helped them with the uh, the foundation to show them where the the original Kaaba was. So they put together some stones, okay, and they built walls about this high, okay, and then they made dua to Allah, oh Allah accept this from us, okay. So from this we learn Allah Subhanahu wa Taala doesn't like things to be nice and glittery and fancy, okay. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala only looks at your intention, your efforts, your sincerity. Remember that. Allah is not after quantity. Allah is after quality. And what counted was sincerity from both father and son. Right. Who rebuilt the foundations of Masjid al-Aqsa? Anyone? The youngsters or sisters as well. Jin? Uh, did you say Muhammad? No. Okay, it was Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salatu wasalam. According to some historians, he rebuilt the foundation of Masjid al-Aqsa along with his son Ishaq. And others have said, no, it was Ishaq who commanded his son Yaqub and both of them together, they built the, rebuilt the foundations of Masjid al-Aqsa. But either way, the Kaaba was rebuilt and the, the Masjid Al-Aqsa were both rebuilt by the family of Ibrahim alayhi salatu wassalam. And the first person to build Masjid Al-Aqsa was Adam alayhi salatu wassalam. And some historians say it was his son Sheikh alayhi salatu wassalam. Allah knows best. Okay. Why is Masjid Al-Aqsa so important to the Muslims? Jin. Yes, uh, as re uh, reported by some of the historians, that the dome of the rock, which is known as the Qubba to Sukhra, is a place where, from that place, Rasulullah he ascended towards the heavens. Okay, so now we have 
the, the golden dome around that. It's a small masjid they've made. It's called Batu Sukh Ranjin. You were going to say something? Yes, it was, it was from that land. But uh, this is the third holiest site for the Muslims. The first is the Kaaba. The second one is Nabi. And this is the third. Okay, and the Prophet uh, he said in authentic hadith, لا تشد الرحالة إلا ثلاثة مساجد مسجد الحرام, مسجد الأقصى, ومسجد هذا He said, do not undertake any journey except to three masajids. إلا ثلاثة مساجد مسجد الحرام, مسجد الأقصى, ومسجد هذا So he said, مسجد الحرام, مسجد الأقصى and also this masjid, meaning he was relating to his own masjid. What does Masjid al-Aqsa mean? What's the meaning of al-Aqsa? At the time of Rasulullah this was the furthest masjid. This was the furthest masjid away from the Prophet Another great significance is that this compound, okay, and Masjid al-Aqsa, this is the closest point to the heavens. Okay, the compound of Al-Aqsa Masjid, this is a, the highest part in the whole of the planet. This is the closest to the heavens. And the lowest is, anyone? Dead Sea. Yes, that's the lowest point on our planet is the Dead Sea. The highest is the compound of uh, Masjid Al-Aqsa. Has anyone been to Masjid Al-Aqsa? Okay, there's, the Masjid Al-Aqsa is like, it's this uh, shape. Okay, it's like a rectangle. So all these walls, the, the, The masjid that we see today, the whole compound, was designed by Sulaiman Okay, And then it's a very big compound. So this is the whole compound. And Masjid Al-Aqsa itself, where the Imam leads the Salah, that, that masjid only covers about this space. So here, that's the masjid. Then you have Dome of the Rock, another small little um, uh, Dome of the Rock. I'll mention that. And then the rest is all empty land. Okay, and, and people pray there. But we get about 450,000 people praying Taraweeh in, in Ramadan, in the whole compound, 450,000. So the question is, why is Masjid al-Aqsa so important to the Muslims? Okay, we said it's the third holiest site. Now, you've all heard of the Al-Isra wa Al-Mi'raj, right? The most sign single talked about event or incident in the Prophet Sallallahu life, in his Makkan life, okay, 53 years. This is the one event, because it happened during his Makkan life. This is the single most talked about event in the Hadith, Al-Isra wa Al-Mi'raj. The Prophet Sallallahu he just lost his uncle, he lost his wife, okay, in Ta'if. He was ill-treated, okay, he was disrespected in, in Ta'if. So now Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi he's feeling very sad. Okay, like all of us would. You've lost your uncle who was your, your support, your wife. She was like your right hand person. And then you're disrespected. You're going to convey the message of Allah. And people disrespect you. Okay, and now he's feeling very low. He's feeling very sad. Okay, so Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala. And this, by the way, wasn't a miracle. It wasn't a miracle like the splitting of the moon. Yes, you call it a miracle. But this was a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for his patience and for his steadfastness. From this we learn that whenever you are going through any problems in your life, as long as you keep that connection with Allah, Allah will reward you something very great. So Allah wanted to call him. It was like the miracle of splitting the moon. Yes, that was a miracle for the people. People used to ask for miracles. If you are a prophet of Allah, show us some miracles, show us a sign. Nobody asked for this miracle. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala called Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is mentioned in the Quran. Subhan al-ladhi asra bi'abdihi laylam min al-masjid al-ahram min al-masjid al-aqsa al-ladhi barakna hawlahu linuriyahu min ayatina inna huwa samil ghasir. Now before I go any further, before I talk about the event of al-istirah bin Mi'raj, how does the Quran describe this land? Two things. The Quran has always described this land as being blessed and muqaddasa, purified. When Musa said to the Banu Israel, he said, Udkhulu al-ard al-muqaddasa alladhi katab Allah lakum. When Musa was saved and his army, 600,000 people, Jews were saved, Banu Israel were saved from Fir'aun, 
Have you heard of the story of Fir'aun when Fir'aun was drowned? Yes. Okay. Musa said to his people, Udkhul al-Ard al Enter this purified land. And did they enter? No. They said, we are not going to enter this land until the current tenants, until those people are currently living there, they don't leave. They are Qawman Jibbareen. They are strange people. We don't want to live with them. They need to leave first. When they leave, then we will enter. And do you know how many people were willing to enter? Just two people. How many? Two. One was Musa, Moses. Number two was his brother Aaron, Harun. The other two, sorry, the other 600,000 didn't want to enter. And for this reason, Allah SWT was disappointed with them. And Allah SWT did not allow any one of them to enter, including Musa and Harun And Musa and Harun Musa died crying to enter the city. But he was not allowed because of his people, because of his followers. And Musa died on the outskirts of Al-Quds. And Prophet said, he said, if I was taken to uh, Al-Quds now, I could show you where the grave of Musa is. So when the Quran talks about the land of Al-Quds, Palestine, it calls it the blessed land, Alladhi Barakna, and it calls it Muqaddasa, purified. Meaning when you go, you are blessed, and when you go, you will be purified. When you go, you'll be purified. Just like Suleiman, Solomon, Suleiman Suleiman, when he built, uh, sorry, when he built the masjid, he also made dua. He made dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for three things. He asked for three things. Number one was a sound judgment, in hikmah. Number two was a customized nation. And number three, whoever enters this masjid seeking the pleasure of Allah and prays two rakah, they go home purified. And Muhammad Sallallahu said, the Prophet said, Allah accepted the first two, and I am pretty much sure he accepted the last one as well. The last request. Meaning Allah gave him a sound with uh, hikmah, a sound judgment. Allah gave him a customized nation, a special nation. And the last thing, meaning whoever enters and prays two rakah, they be purified. Prophet Sallallahu said, I am pretty much sure that that was also accepted as well. You've all heard of Abdullah ibn Umar, the famous Sahabi. He would leave Medina and go to Al-Quds. And when he would enter Al-Quds, he would not talk to anyone. No salam, no kalam. No drinking, no eating. He would go in, pray to Raqqa and leave straight away. Because he was afraid that if I, before praying to Raqqa or even after praying to Raqqa, if I start talking to people, or I start buying things, or I start eating, my intention will change. My intention will change that I didn't go to pray those two rakats. So when we go to Al-Aqsa, or when we go to Hajj, you've heard of the famous hadith that whoever goes and performs Hajj, okay, and the Hajj is accepted, they come back, returning like the day they were born. I mean, all of your sins are wiped out, major and minor, all wiped out. And the same is with here as well. Ibn al-Jawzi, rahimahullah, would say that Ibrahim sanctified Makkah. Okay? Nobody knew about Makkah. Makkah to al-Muqarrabah, nobody heard of it. Only until Ibrahim, alayhi left his wife and his young child in Makkah to al-Muqarrabah. Okay? رَبَّنَا إِنِّي أَسْكَنْتُ مِنْ ذُرِّيَّةِ بِوَادِنَ غَيْرِ ذِي زَرْعٍ عِنْدَ بَيْتِكَ الْمُحَرَّمِ this is a dua he's making that, oh Allah, I leave my young family, my small family in this barren valley. And when he left his wife and his son in, in Mecca at that time, there was nothing there. There was no greenery. There, there, there were no people living. It was mountains. They were surrounded by mountains and, and no one there. And he left his young family there. Okay. And then he made dua to Allah protect my family, look after my family and help them to establish salah as well. So this is the first time when people heard of Makkah al Mukarramah. And then he says, the Prophet ﷺ, he sanctified Medina. Meaning Muhammad ﷺ, he sanctified Medina. Because Medina again was unheard, nobody heard of Medina until Prophet ﷺ made hijrah then. And then number three, he says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala himself sanctified Masjid al-Aqsa. 
Because Allah has called it blessed. Allah has called it sacred. Allah has called it purified. Amazing. So going back to Al-Isra wal Mi'raj. Don't you think Allah was able to take Rasulullah from the Kaaba straight to Jannah? Yes or no? Was Allah not able to do this? Of course he was. Why did he go through the station of Masjid al-Aqsa? Why? This is where we learn the importance of Masjid al-Aqsa. If Allah wanted to, Allah would have saved him the hassle and taken him straight from the Hijri, the Hatim, straight to heavens, Jannah. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took him through Masjid al-Aqsa. That was the main station, the main stop, the main service station. You know when you're going on a long journey in M6 and you stop at the service station? This was his service station where he stopped and he performed his two rakah. And then he was offered some milk and wine and he chose wine. He chose milk, sorry. And uh, Jibreel said, you have chosen the natural, the fitra, right? And your ummah will be guided with this. And then he was told to lead the salah. And one, approximately 140 or 1,000 prophets are waiting. The very, very place, the one place on earth where every single prophet has prayed. Ibn Abbas would say that this is such a land that there is not a single part where a prophet has not prayed, an angel has not stood, or where a prophet is buried. I mean, the whole land is sacred. And the Prophet ﷺ, he led the salah. And we learned so many lessons from this. Number one is the importance of Al-Aqsa. Look, Allah is diverting our attention towards Al-Aqsa. And number two, what was the destination? Where did Prophet ﷺ want to reach? Jannah. So if you want to go to Jannah, you have to go through a masjid praying salah. This is a general lesson for us as well. Our, our destination is? Jannah. We come into this world to go back to Jannah. Where did we come from? We came from Jannah. Yes? Adam was sent out from Jannah. We want to go back to Jannah. Okay? That's our destination. So we need to work hard. We need to sweat. We need to live like good Muslims. Good obedient Muslims. Okay? Respecting our parents. Respecting our elders. Respecting Muslims and non-Muslims alike as well. Because the Quran has commanded us to respect non-Muslims as well. Okay? And my khutbah was, and Jum'ah was about this. How Allah has taught his akhlaq in the Quran. Okay. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and I'll come to that verse in a short while. But the point is, that if you want to go to Jannah, number one, you have to go through the masjid, praying salah, and then you go to Jannah. So have that connection with the masjid. Okay, so that's one lesson we learned. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wanted to draw our attention towards the masjid al-Aqsa, and then Prophet led the salah from there. And from there he went to Jannah and he met Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Look at the importance. This is why Masjid al-Aqsa is important to the Muslims. And another thing as well. Did Adam Ali Satusam, did he build a temple or a masjid? A masjid. Did Suleiman Ali Satusam build a temple or a masjid? He built a masjid. It's, it's always been a masjid. A masjid is the meaning of masjid is a place of prostration. That's the literal meaning. A place for all Muslims. A place for those who believe in Allah. A place for the Millah of Ibrahim, the followers of Ibrahim alayhi Because that's what we are commanded to do. فَاتَّبِعُوا مِلَّةَ إِبْرَاهِيمَ حَنِيفًا وَمَا كَانَ مِنَ الْمُشْرِكِينَ Follow the Millah, the religion of Ibrahim alayhi And he was not from the polytheists. And Muhammad sallallahu he didn't bring a new religion. He brought the Millah of Ibrahim, the religion of Ibrahim alayhi Another great thing is that, do you know that for 18 months, the Qibla of the Muslims was what? It was Masjid al-Aqsa. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala unified the religions of Ishaq and Ismail through that one Qibla. And do you know any doubts that the Christians or the Jews had during those 18 months when the Muslims used to pray towards um, Al-Quds? you know what they used to say? They would say, there's a slight chance that he is a prophet of God. And what reference do they give? Because he prays facing Al-Quds. Meaning he prays 
facing the same direction as us. Because the Jews, they face towards Masjid Al-Aqsa when they pray. Even now they pray towards Masjid Al-Aqsa. If you go to Al-Aqsa, you'll see a lot of the settlers, they, they sit outside of the Masjid, the compound of the Masjid, and they pray. And, you know, it's said that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, one of the wisdoms behind this was that He unified, He united, sorry, the religions of Ishaq and Ismail alayhi salatu wasalam. So this is why it's important to the Muslims. Masjid Al-Aqsa is important to the Muslims. Now, the other point I wanted to make was how was Masjid Al-Aqsa handed over to the Muslims? Have you heard of Heraclius, anyone? He was a ruler at that time of this land, Al-Quds. And he had a dream, a vision. And in his dream he saw that a nation who had been circumcised would overtake his kingdom. Okay? So when he woke up in the morning, he automatically thought that it was going to be the Jews. Because nobody heard of the Muslims at that time. Abu Sufyan, who knew about Muhammad, he was a traveller. He was, he was travelling through Al-Quds. And then the next day, Heraclius received a letter from Muhammad وسلم, inviting him to Islam. Right? So that dream was really the circumcised nation was not the Jews, it was the Muslims. Okay? So he read the letter and then he looked up and he said, Is there anyone here, he made an announcement, who knows who this person Muhammad is? I've just received a letter from him. Does anyone know who Muhammad is? And of all people, Abu Sufyan was there. He was the governor of Mecca. He said, yes, I know. I remember Abu Sufyan was not a Muslim. He, was not, he didn't embrace Islam yet. He said, tell me about this man, Muhammad. Tell me about him. Now, if if Abu, Abu Sufyan wanted, he would have said a lot of wrong things. And he said, make sure you tell me the truth or else you will be in trouble. And then Abu Sufyan told him that this guy, this, this man, Muhammad, he is one of the best people in Mecca, the most truthful, the most honest, the most kindest, the most gentlest, the most generous. And he was nothing but praise. This is in fact the hadith of Abu Sufyan. It's an authentic hadith. He describes this event. And Abu Sufyan said, after that, when I left, I saw Heraclius crying. And he put his head on the letter of Muhammad and he was crying like this, he was crying. And he wanted to embrace Islam. He always had a soft spot for Islam. But he was scared that he was going to lose his kingdom. So what happened? He further strengthened the theology of Christianity. So rather than embracing Islam, he learned a lot of things from Islam. And then he brought that into his own theology, Christian theology. Now years later, during the caliphate of Umar ibn al-Khattab, when after the battle of Yarmouk, Heraclius decided to hand over Al-Quds to uh, Umar ibn al-Khattab. He wanted to give now, he's giving the land to the Muslims. So he makes this announcement. He says that I will give the keys, because now the, the Muslims have reached Yarmouk, they've, they've reached Jordan, They're about to enter Palestine. And he says, yes, I will give, I will give the keys to the Muslims, but I want the Khalifa of the Muslims to come and collect the keys. So Umar ibn Khattab was given this message. So now Umar ibn Khattab has left Medina. And he's on his way and he reaches Al-Quds. And do you know how Heraclius respected him? They said he put a red carpet for two miles long. Two miles long there was a red carpet. And then the military the army of Heraclius, they stood on either side to welcome Umar ibn al-Khattab. And Umar ibn al-Khattab came with his khadim. And they agreed that for one or two miles, Umar will sit on the camel and the khadim will walk. And then for the next two, three miles, they're going to stop and have turns. And when they got closer to Al-Quds, the khadim was sitting on the camel and Umar ibn al-Khattab was walking. And the khadim said to him, don't you think it's best to... You know, you sit in the camel now and I walk because this is not going to look right. Umar said, no. Our agreement was this. We're going to stick with our agreement. So now they're entering. And Umar ibn Khattab is walking and his khadim, his slave is on the camel. And a lot of the famous harbi like Amr ibn al-As was there. 
Abu Baidullah ibn al-Jarrah, may Allah be pleased with them, they were there. And when they looked at Umar ibn Khattab, Umar ibn Khattab, the Khalifa, the governor of the Muslims, he had about 18 patches on his clothes. 18 patches on his clothes. And Abu Bayd ibn al-Jarrah, he went to Umar ibn Khattab quietly and said, What are you doing? Why are you dressed like this for? Like, couldn't you get a, like, a, a nice cleaner jubba? You know, you know, so many people here are welcoming and you're dressed like this. And Umar ibn Khattab, he tapped him on his shoulder like this. He like this. said, I would never have expected a statement like this coming from you. He said, do you not know that Allah gave us izza? Allah gave us respect in our religion, not the way we dress. Allah gave us our respect in our religion, not in our clothing. And then he entered and Heracles gave him the key. And from there, officially after that, um, Al-Quds was always for the Muslims. It belonged to the Muslims. 